This video is sponsored by Surfshark. In the crystal clear shallow waters of the Pacific Ocean, something is stirring around the ruins of an atomic past. Sharks, but different to how you might have seen them before. What if I told you that nuclear testing from over 70 years ago might have changed them all the way down to their DNA? Welcome to Bikini Atoll, a place once blasted by atomic fire and now rumored to be home to mutant sharks. But are these just legends born from sensationalized fear or is there some real science behind the myth? Well, stay tuned because what scuba divers and scientists have found in this remote atoll might just reveal the true environmental cost of human experimentation. Welcome back to another Shark Bites episode, everyone. Now, slap bang in the middle of the Pacific Ocean then is this picturesque atoll, frozen in time. Bikini Atoll is a tropical paradise turned radioactive graveyard. Saying those two things out loud doesn't quite seem right, but that's exactly what it is. But to understand the oddities of what's going on beneath Bikini's turquoise waves, we've got to go back in time, all the way to the 1940s. <laughs> The world was just emerging from the horrors of the Second World War, ended at least in some part by the dropping of two atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan in 1945. These super weapons, still very much in their infancy, were thought at the time to be the new face of warfare, and so their advancement and continued testing was considered by the US government to be paramount. That paired with growing strategic competition against the Soviet Union meant more atomic bomb tests, but the question was where? Testing on American soil was doable, they'd already successfully detonated the world's first atomic bomb in New Mexico, but big atmospheric tests on US soil were risky because of its close proximity to people. So they decided to look for a more suitable location, and the Marshall Islands, which were slap bang in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, fit the bill. This tiny group of coral atolls and islands just after the Second World War was under legal custodianship by the US. The Marshall Islands were considered to be remote enough to appease safety concerns, while also close enough to existing US naval bases to help with the crazy logistical challenges of nuclear testing. The incredibly large lagoons enabled the US military to anchor big ships for testing land, underwater, and above water explosions. And after removing the indigenous population of Micronesian Islanders in an act of true nuclear colonialism, the site was now ready for Operation Crossroads. Five, four, three, two, one. Between 1946 and 1958, the US detonated over 20 nuclear bombs at Bikini Atoll, the combined yield of which was around 77 million tons of TNT. To give you a bit of an idea of how much that is, Little Boy, the bomb that devastated the Japanese city of Hiroshima, was thought to be around 15,000 tons of TNT, so about 5,000 times more. Over these 12 years, large parts of the atoll were completely destroyed. Vegetation and wildlife, both on land and in the sea, were incinerated in probably one of the most grim cases of ecocide for its time. In one of these tests, the Castle Bravo test, one island was virtually obliterated as the US trialed its strongest ever hydrogen bomb thousand times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. And the evidence of this test still remains today, with the two kilometer wide and 76 meter deep crater being visible from space. The Castle Bravo test, which ended up being a lot stronger and a lot bigger than the nuclear scientists anticipated, caused widespread radioactive fallout for miles. And it's still considered to this day to be the worst radiological disaster in US history, leaching extraordinarily high levels of radiation into both the people who were there and the surrounding environment. It was so bad that it was actually this test that led to the US's eventual departure from the Marshall Islands due to international pressures related to atmospheric bomb testing. By 1958 and 13 more bomb tests later, the US military halted their testing program and left, leaving behind some military personnel to guard the area. But the environmental impact of this monstrous amount of radiation would remain in the area right up until today. In the years since 1958, the Bikini Island residents who had been forced to leave tried to return to their home, but each time were evacuated due to radiation contamination in the ground, which was seeping into vegetation and food sources. Specifically, the island's population of coconut crabs, known for their consumption of, yep, you guessed it, coconuts, were found to be highly irradiated and were poisoning the locals. We'll come back to some of these food sources a bit later on, by the way. But just really quickly before we carry on, I want to introduce you guys to today's official video sponsor, Surfshark, the sharkiest way to surf the World Wide Web. Surfshark is a VPN, which is a virtual private network, and it basically encrypts all of the information sent between your computer and the internet so that no one can steal all of your personal data. Although one of the main reasons that I use Surfshark is because this app and browser 
extension allows you to virtually migrate across oceans with just a single click. This summer just gone, I was on a Shark Week show, but I couldn't access the Discovery Channel here in the UK because of country acquired exclusive rights, which suck. Although with a single click of my trackpad, I was able to set my region to the US and bam, there I am dweebing about angel sharks on Discovery Plus. It's just crazy how many data breaches are going on around the world at the moment, where people's personal information is being taken and then distributed willy nilly. But that's the great thing about Surfshark. It protects you from data breaches and hacks like that by encrypting all of your online data, keeping you safe on public Wi-Fi networks, which is actually really handy when I'm working on Shark Bites videos in a cafe or a library. Surfshark has a whole bunch of features that just make surfing the internet that much safer, blocking cookie pop-up ads or malicious websites. But absolutely best of all though, if you guys use the code SHARKBITES like you can see on screen now, that's gonna get you an extra four months of Surfshark VPN. You can also use the link in the description below to get that deal, which is surfshark.com forward slash SHARKBITES. And there's nothing to worry about because Surfshark gives you a 30 day money back guarantee. Happy days. Now, where were we? Oh yeah, it's no surprise that after dropping all of those nuclear bombs then, that Bikini Atoll was completely irradiated. But as the years went by, scientists who occasionally headed out to the atoll for research found that background radiation levels on the island were starting to balance out to normal natural levels. But the contamination in the vegetation and the wildlife remained, so it's essentially remained uninhabited now for the last 70 years or so. But just because it's been deemed unsafe for permanent habitation, that doesn't mean that no one's allowed to go there ever. Considering the site's been virtually untouched for what, nearly three quarters of a century now, but also was this place of mass destruction and contamination, it's a very intriguing case study for scientists. You'd think that after all that devastation and destruction during those years, the waters of Bikini Atoll would be devoid of all life, silent like the surface of the moon. But they weren't. In 2002, marine scientist Zoe Richards, after a research dive, discovered that some coral species within the two kilometer wide Bravo crater had not only recovered, but were thriving. Huge mattresses of branching porite coral, some up to eight meters high, were creating a dynamic coral reef habitat. It's pretty rare that you find corals the size of literal trees, but that's exactly what she found. Zoe and her team believe the regeneration of these coral habitats was in part due to a neighboring atoll known as Rongelap Atoll. Rongelap is one of the largest atolls in the world with a huge biomass of coral, and coincidentally, it sits just up current from Bikini, which means that when those corals spawn, lots of their larvae are swept down the current into Bikini Atoll, where they've begun their new colonies. And with healthy, abundant coral reef habitats comes a vast array of marine life. 15 years after Zoe's research expedition, a new team of researchers led by Professor Steve Palumbi descended into the depths of Bikini Atoll. And like Zoe Richards, they were met with an underwater world teeming with life. The lagoon itself was full of a diverse range of coral and fish species swirling around in huge numbers. Invertebrates like crabs and lobsters were numerous, and with such an abundance of smaller prey species, you're also going to get predators as well. Multiple shark species have been observed in the waters of the atoll, with the dominant species undoubtedly being grey reef sharks. Anecdotally, large aggregations of grey reefs, sometimes over a hundred individuals strong, are regularly seen swimming along the fore reef, and there's not just lots of them, they're big as well. These grey reef sharks at Bikini Atoll have been visually estimated to average over 150 centimetres in length, which for a species that matures at around 120 to 130 centimetres, tells you many of them are big adults. It's not just grey reef sharks though, silver tips, black tip and white tip reef sharks are all common, and the area's even been speculated to be a tiger shark nurse as well. Divers have occasionally reported one to two meter long inquisitive juvenile tiger sharks approaching them on their safety stops. And there's actually so many sharks here that Bikini Atoll is considered to be an ISRA or an important shark ray area. And it's because of this shark diversity that I imagine shark scientists are likely heading to Bikini Atoll or perhaps are already even writing the scientific publications about the species here. Anyway, during Steve Palumbi's 2017 expedition, while on a few of their dives, they noticed something strange. Now, nurse sharks, which is what you're seeing on your screen right now, aren't an inherent inherently strange thing to see in a habitat like this, and they're pretty widely distributed across the Pacific. But the nurse sharks that Steve was seeing were odd. These sharks, unlike other members of their own species, only had one dorsal fin. Here's a quick side-by-side -side for those who are trying to remember what a regular nurse shark looks like, and you can see that second dorsal fin pretty clearly there, whereas this bikini atoll nurse shark definitely only has one. So these nurse sharks, by technical classification, are mutated individuals. Now there's no exact confirmation of just how many tawny nurse sharks in the atoll have this mutation, because there's no scientific publications that have been written about it. Steve Palumbi in his quotes refers to them as individuals, which would imply they had seen more than one, but 
but we can't know that for sure. And if you were to read any of the media headlines about this, you'd probably be forgiven for thinking that Bikini Atoll was riddled with two-headed shark dolphin mutant hybrids, but of course that's not the case. To tell you the truth, unless someone managed to get a skin biopsy from one of those nurse sharks, we aren't going to be able to know for sure, but let's presume for a minute that the cause was radiation. How is it that these nurse sharks, who clearly weren't around when the bomb testing was happening, have been irradiated? Well, just like those displaced Bikini Island residents who couldn't return because they were being poisoned by their food, the same could be said for these sharks. Radiation can bioaccumulate up the food chain, so possibly things feeding on, say, algae on those ancient corals have been irradiated, which then passes on to invertebrates like crabs, which then passes on to the nurse sharks. And with each trophic level it moves upwards, that radiation gets biomagnified, so the organisms at the top are more at risk from the dangerous effects of it, and therefore show the evidence of it. Once in their bodies, that radiation alters the nitrogenous bases of the DNA. That's your adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, which leads to potential replication errors and mutations. It's kind of like a typo in a big line of text that then gets photocopied a million times. To give you an example here that isn't a hypothetical food chain, back in 2023, some research came out highlighting radioactive uranium signatures in various turtles collected from around the world. The highest amount of uranium found within these various turtle samples was from a green sea turtle shell collected from the Marshall Islands in 1978. 20 years after nuclear testing had stopped. And based on the size of the turtle shell, the scientists concluded it was highly unlikely that the turtle was living during the bomb testing, so it wouldn't have been irradiated directly from the bombs, but more likely from the radioactive fallout that had contaminated the environment. The shell in question came from Enowetak Atoll, which you can see on this map here sits to the west of Bikini Atoll. And where exactly did the turtle shell come from? Oh yeah, a tiger shark that was caught off a pier on Enowetak Island. There's no doubt then that that tiger shark, as a top trophic level predator, was a assimilating uranium within its tissues from the turtle it had eaten. And that's just one turtle and one tiger shark. How many more of them were there out there? Now, this speculative stuff is all well and good, but here's an issue that I've got. If radiation was passing up to these sharks at the top of the food chain, then why are we not seeing evidence of it in any of the other shark species? We don't have any notes about that tiger shark that ate the radioactive turtle, but there's no mention of it displaying any kind of radiation evidence. And by all other accounts, the grey reef sharks and black tip reef sharks and white tip reef sharks show no signs that they have any visible mutations either, like missing fins or one eye or something like that. So the fact that on the face of it, it only seems to be evident in the nurse sharks, it kind of reminded me of just how many nurse sharks we see with genetic mutations. Hell, I even did a video about it a few months back when we had that tango orange nurse shark crop up in Central America. And although there isn't any statistical evidence of this, anecdotally it does seem nurse sharks feature a fair amount when we hear about shark mutations, especially the skin ones. And after doing a bit of reading around based on a few scientific research papers that I've read, it seems that nurse sharks could potentially be more prone to mutations via a process that they employ called somatic hypermutation. I know, stick with me guys. Somatic hypermutation is a bit of a double-edged sword, so it's vital for a healthy immune system, which I imagine is why nurse sharks have such an incredible immune response. But when the process escapes the normal confines within the body, it can lead to mutations in other parts of the genome, which could be why we're seeing more abnormalities in nurse sharks compared to other shark species, at least anecdotally. So could these mutated nurse sharks with only one dorsal fin in Bikini Atoll just be a normal representation of mutation rates within the species? Could their already increased chances of abnormalities because of that somatic hypermutation be then amplified by their irradiated food and make them even more susceptible here? These are all questions, guys, that unfortunately, as of right now, I don't have the answers for you. But I can almost guarantee there's someone out there right now analyzing that data that might shine a light on it. For the time being, it's just one of those strange places where there's been so much human interference down the years, but somehow the animals that live there have thrived. I think the fact that no one's been able to fish there for decades is definitely a big factor in this as well. So because it was just too dangerous to eat anything from the atoll, it meant that it sort of became a de facto marine protected area, and the animals that lived there were relatively safe from human activities. I think it just shows you how resilient these populations are at bouncing back if we just give them a little bit of a helping hand. Big thanks to Surfshark for sponsoring today's video. Make sure you guys use that Shark Bites discount code that you can see on screen now, or you can click the link in the description below. The whole human wildlife interference thing I just find so odd. And this case here is somewhat similar to the situation in Qatar with the whale sharks and the oil rigs. And I tell you all about that in this video here. You're not gonna believe the reason why hundreds of whale sharks have decided to hold in on just one single oil platform out of thousands. So if you want to find out exactly why, make sure you give this video a watch.